Hello, my name is Mark Fisher. I'm professor of neurology at UC Irvine and a stroke neurologist. Hi, I'm Steve Greenberg. I'm a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and also a stroke neurologist. Steve and I have been involved with developing an important American Heart Association science advisory. This is titled Vascular Neurology Considerations for Anti-Amyloid Immunotherapy, a science advisory from the American Heart Association. I chaired the committee, Steve Vice chaired the committee, and Steve is the lead author on this significant paper, uh, which addresses an emerging important topic in neurology, in geriatric neurology, and particularly for stroke neurology, which is the primary focus of this paper. Uh, as you know, we have entered a new era in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease, yes, is now a treatable disease. Uh, and the treatment is a drug that has as its prime adverse effects, uh, stroke-related adverse effects. Uh, and these are symptoms and signs that come to the attention of, a, uh, of stroke neurologists. And the purpose of this science advisory is to review the primary issues that are going to be of greatest concern for neurologists in general and stroke neurologists in particular. Uh, the primary adverse event, events that we're concerned about are referred to as ARIA, A-R-I-A, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. These are referred to as, as area E and area H. Area E are the edematous complications. Area H are the hemorrhagic complications. Uh, these are adverse events that are not rare. They occur in about 20% uh, of the patients receiving anti-amyloid therapy, uh, uh, great, actually greater than 20%, for either the uh, edematous or the hemorrhagic side of aria. So it's important to understand what these adverse events are, uh, what the clinical and radiographic manifestations are, and how they may be treated. So to get a better understanding of what this is all about, let's first talk uh, in a little bit of detail about what exactly is aria, Dr. Greenberg. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Mark. It's really uh, and credit to the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, for recognizing that this is going to be a growing challenge that will often come to us as vascular neurologists, um, even though uh, many of us don't particularly work in the Alzheimer field, but uh, the, the field will be coming to us uh, with questions about immunotherapy as they relate to ARIA and other vascular issues. And we're really in a complex situation with ARIA that it is, um, as you say, quite common. And sometimes the imaging findings can be rather dramatic, but most often it's asymptomatic. It's most often a silent finding. And even in the people in which it's symptomatic, in which one of these things, for instance, the edema or the effusions trigger focal neurologic symptoms or headaches or, or seizures, um, the symptoms usually resolve pretty quickly with cessation of the treatment. And it's not at all clear that ARIA as a group is damaging to the brain. It seems that if you just take all comers with ARIA, they may do about as well as the people who don't have ARIA. There are even been some who think maybe it's a sign of uh, the removal of amyloid and, and could even be uh, marginally beneficial. Um, but that said, it is not uh, uniformly harmless. And there's a subgroup of people who a permanent neurologic disability or death. There have been dramatic reports of deaths either related to a, a kind of malignant uh, edema that, that uh, doesn't improve um, even over course of uh, hospitalization or people with intracerebral hemorrhages, which are certainly damaging to the brain. So this creates quite a, a conundrum for the treating physicians to know when to accept some risk of ARIA, but when to recognize uh, the danger of ARIA and use it as a, a balancing factor against whatever benefits the, the amyloid immunotherapies provide. The mechanism of ARIA is uh, probably complicated and may involve more than one step, but the, the common denominator seems to be the amyloid in the blood vessels. And in a way, it's not 
surprising because both edema, fusions, and hemorrhage are all vascular phenomena. And it's a plausible model that has a, a fair amount of experimental support that it's direct interaction between these anti-amyloid antibodies that are given with the purposes of removing the amyloid in the senile neuritic plaques that drive Alzheimer's disease, that those antibodies can also engage with the amyloid that's deposited in the blood vessels in the form of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And we know that, that uh, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, CAA pathology, is quite common. It's particularly common in, in uh, individuals who have Alzheimer's pathology as well. And that direct engagement of the antibodies may drive both the edema and the hemorrhage uh, that is characteristic of these different forms of aria. And for now, that's uh, probably the strongest working model for the, uh, the basis of, of, of generating aria. That's terrific. Thanks, Steve. Well, in looking at the primary issues uh, that clinicians are addressing in terms of uh, uh, adverse effects of anti-amyloid. And, and just in terms of the numbers, just as a reminder, we're talking about the, the severe adverse effects on the edematous side range in, uh, from 1% to 2% of the uh, patient population receiving this, uh, receiving this medication. And on the hemorrhagic side, we're talking about 0.5% uh, 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 roughly of uh, patients who receive the medication. So while uh, the presence of aria is not uncommon, uh, the actual severe manifestations of aria uh, are uh, uncommon. But uh, nevertheless, considering their consequences, it's really important that we be familiar uh, with this phenomena and also be able to anticipate it. Well, in understanding this drug and uh, the considerations that we have to deal with, there are three basic areas that we'd like to cover today in this discussion. The first, uh, uh, first issue is what about the use of anti-amyloid therapy in patients who have pre-existing cerebral vascular disease? Uh, this is a common consideration. And that cerebral vascular disease, of course, can range from ischemic to hemorrhagic disease, but it's an important consideration. So Steve, what are your thoughts on that topic? Yeah, and it sort of comes out of what we were talking about earlier, Mark, that, that the strongest predictors likely for who will develop aria is who has a lot of uh, CAA or, or amyloid in the blood vessels. The Really, the strongest predictor has been APOE genotype. So this uh, apolipoprotein E and the, the E4 allele of APOE, uh, which is a, a predictor of having both Alzheimer's pathology and also CAA pathology, is clearly a marker of increased risk for aria. Uh, the, in the clinical trials, in general, people were allowed in regardless of their APOE genotype, but with clear differences in the risk for ARIA. And the current FDA labeling allows anybody to be treated, but particular caution that the, the labeling does recommend APOE genotyping as a kind of predictor of ARIA risk. And that's probably not operating just through CAA. I think there's a good chance that there are other mechanisms involved with the APOE effects on ARIA risk, but that's one of the, the predictors. Let, let's go on to the next major issue uh, that uh, we deal with in clinical neurology. And this is of particular interest for the stroke neurologist. And it has to do with the use of antithrombotic and thrombolytic medications. Uh, so what we're talking about is questions related to can uh, patients receiving this uh, anti-amyloid therapy, can they receive aspirin or clopidogrel? Uh, the second issue is anticoagulant. Uh, what about the patient with atrial fibrillation uh, who would be a potential candidate for anti-amyloid therapy? Uh, and then, of course, what about the patient presenting with an acute stroke where the patient would normally be given strong consideration for thrombolytic therapy, either TPA or tenecteplase, uh, does the presence uh, or does the use of anti-amyloid therapy preclude treatment of acute ischemic stroke with thrombolytic agents? Steve, what do you think? For now, the FDA has recommended caution in using anticoagulants. The appropriate use recommendation I mentioned before for lecanemab has recommended against use of lecanemab in individuals who have an indication who are taking anticoagulants. 
I think that is a, a reasonable consideration. I don't think it is reasonable to stop somebody's anticoagulant in order to be able to give them lecanemab. We don't think the benefits of the, the anti-amyloid immunotherapies are so great to outweigh the very well-established benefits of anticoagulation. So I think that's not a reason to stop somebody's anticoagulant. And then a quite scary issue is use of thrombolytics, scary in that we now have two reports of individuals who presented with stroke-like symptoms. And, you know, we put an asterisk on stroke-like symptoms because we know that some can be stroke mimics, uh, but two people who are felt to have strokes and were treated with, in one case, uh, alteplase, in one case, tenecteplase, and had deadly multifocal intracerebral hemorrhages. And in retrospect, and based on the, some pathology from one of the cases, uh, in fact, that may not have been a, a stroke at all, may have been REAE presenting as a stroke mimic. And this has made its way into the, the FDA labeling for denanumab. They have a black box warning saying that high scrutiny should be given for the possibility that somebody with stroke-like symptoms, in fact, is having a REAE presenting as a stroke mimic and to have great caution. My approach to patients in this situation would really be to try to establish uh, beyond question that somebody is in fact having a stroke before even considering a thrombolytic. We know time is brain, we try to move quickly, but in this case, the extra caution is needed. I should note that there's no evidence for increased bleeding risk among people receiving mechanical thrombectomy without a thrombolytic. And I think, again, based on no good data, but based on what we know about the effects of mechanical thrombectomy, I think that should be considered a reasonable option without anything currently to point to uh, mechanical thrombectomy being higher risk. That's great. Uh, and uh, I would uh, just remind everyone that to get into these topics and issues in more detail, please read the paper. Um, we've got uh, an outstanding group of co-authors and uh, Steve and I are so appreciative of all the input from all of the outstanding co-authors that we've uh, uh, been able to work with uh, for this paper. Uh, I think we've got an excellent start uh, in terms of how to approach this complex and serious issue of neurovascular complications of anti-amyloid therapy. Uh, once again, we want to thank the American Heart Association uh, for their leadership on this important issue, sponsoring this advisory. Uh, we want to thank our, uh, again, thank our co-authors uh, for all their hard work on this. Uh, and we wish you, the audience, uh, our best wishes uh, in the treatment of these patients. Please go back and uh, read our paper, look at the citations, uh, and familiarize yourself with this complex issue. Uh, it will require more than one look, uh, given the uh, uh, extent of the, uh, the issues that are involved. Uh, so with that, uh, I wish you well, and thanks for listening, and good day. Thanks very much.